Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of the literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for part five of a nine-part series as we journey through what is poetry. Uh, the supposed answer to a question by John Hall Wheelock, and I fear this video might be a bit short, because all I really have to say here is, nah -uh, and all I really have to offer here is a bit of confusion. This chapter is titled, To Recapture Delight. And we open, as we have opened all of these chapters, with a quote from a poet. This coming to us from Dryden. Delight is the chief, if not the only, end of poetry. And I cannot disagree more strongly. I don't understand why everyone in this book seems to believe that happiness is a right. I don't understand why enjoyment would be chief among the would be chief among the charges put on the voice of the oppressed. I don't know why enjoyment would be prized when as we've already talked about it was just last video right yeah last video um the poem in the nuclear age you mean to tell me that the poem in the nuclear age is your primary source of happiness that's not doing it correctly poetry is not nor has it ever been simply something to be enjoyed and if it is limericks maybe is what you're talking about not poetry trident but um, we get into the meat of this, and we will start, as is our tradition, by reading the opening paragraph, the main thrust of the argument for this chapter. It reads as such. The key to the, the, key to the tragic nature of things is the division into selves. Conscious being becomes possible only in a self, yet to be a self means to be capable of pain as well as of pleasure, and brings with it the ultimate penalty of death. Moreover, the very fact of selfhood implies separation, implies clash of interests. Just as two bodies cannot occupy the same space at the same time, so the desires, even the needs of the self, often collide needs of selves often collide. Suffering is, therefore, of the essence of being. The self is selfish, and in its selfishness so requires for individual survival, is at odds with another greater multitudinous entity, the non-self. We find the primal expression of this dichotomy in the praying of life upon life. The biological necessity to which man in common with other animals, is subject. This conflict is further exemplified in the competitive struggle between men, whether in war or so-called peace. Religion attempts to find a solution on the human level. Christianity, the religion of the West, finds the answer in the love that expresses itself in self-sacrifice. Christ on the cross symbolizes, among other things, the reconciliation between self and non-self through a supreme act of self-sacrificing love. Love restores, in some measure, the unity broken by the division into cells. We are now so far off topic that we might, in fact, need a sacrifice in order to be shown the grace necessary to reclaim our mission. Thank you, John Hall Wheelock, for this diversion into the strange and the odd that is simultaneously condescending and smarmy, which is tough to pull off. Condescending in that, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, the religion of the West, everybody over here is Christian. And don't get me started on the smarmy. And don't get me started on the, the brotherly love junk either, okay? But uh, it might be necessary to move on because I'm just getting salty. Uh, we get this quote on 48. We have now reached a stage in history where recognition of this oneness becomes imperative. Man's cleverness 
has finally caught up with him. It is a truism that survival now depends on something much greater than cleverness, upon mutual goodwill, charity, and cooperation, upon complete and effective realization that we are one. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Sure. I'll, I'll grant it. I, I am willing to grant it. I will give you that if you want it. What does it have to do with the titular question that we should be pursuing? Nothing, not a damn thing. Come on, John, I want to get back on track. Not sure we're going to get there, though. On 49, we get this. During the first two decades of the 20th century, a direction sharply divergent from that in its immediate past, the work of Ezra Pound and of T.S. Eliot in criticism and in poetry marked the beginning of a revolution in both fields whose influence was to be paramount during the rest of the half century. And, again, whether the new direction taken was a desirable direction or in the line of the true tradition or not, we may be... We may be sure that no amount of critical acumen could have foreseen or critical exhortation have changed it. Mr. Pound and Mr. Eliot, men of genius, through whose work French literature has become once more the dominant influence in English poetry, were the voices of a point of view and a state of mind that had long been evolving and that were destined under the pressures of the coming decades to evolve still further in the same direction. I think that is an interesting point. I think that it is worth looking to more contemporary in, 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 in the direction of Eliot and Pound sources as well as the Shakespeare's of the world, um, the Milton's of the world. It is necessary to take all of these voices into consideration when trying to formulate your own opinion of what is poetry, what should poetry do, what is the charge of the art form. Um, and that's all I've really got to say about that. But we are trending in a direction which we saw coming. And we start to get there. Yeah. Also, Pound and Elliot were weirdos. I don't know if you knew that. If, if you haven't looked into Pound and Elliot's lives, they were flawed men for sure who definitely hit the scene like sticks of dynamite. Uh, definitely worth looking up if you've not uh, know, if you do not know anything about their lives. For a little while here in this chapter, we just sort of amble about pining again for more emotion in poetry. Um, and then we make the posit that nuclear bombs are to blame. We don't back this up. We simply move on. Uh, a man of conviction, John Hall Wheelock, and I can admire that. But we get to a quote on 55, which bugs the ever-loving hell out of me. So... I think if you have followed the channel for any reasonable amount of time, you come to the conclusion that Adrian is not necessarily a PC person. I have my odds with the social justice warrior movement because it seems largely to be an attempt to oppress in an opposite direction. Um, and because of this, I use terms like humankind instead of mankind. Or in, in light of, however the arguments presented that are reasonable, that make sense. I use terms like humankind instead of mankind. Um, I make adjustments in my daily speech. I say his or her when writing something like this book. I think that it is not necessarily a mark of sexism for a male author to use the term in his own, in his world, things like that, because... Uh, using one's own gender in the writing would be the most comfortable to do. Just like I would not consider it sexist for a woman to say her own throughout her text. But Wheelock has assumed Christianity 
in his reader several times now, it seems, does use sexist language, which was language of the day. Um, this book being published in the 50s, I believe. Um, so, 63. So, language of the day, but language with sexist markers. We have a lot of assuming going on here from Wheelock. That's the part that really bugs me. The assumptions that he's putting into his writings. Um, and this is something that one has to do to some extent in order to write a book called, not, not the sexist or racist or bigoted statements, things like that, but assuming the um, authority is something one has to do in order to write a, a text called What is Poetry, right? In order to answer such a gargantuan question, one has to assume the authority. But then we come, ultimately, on page 55 to this quote. But whatever else a poem may be, it should be enjoyable. A. Why? B. To whom? C. Uh, we get we, the little moment in there. Whatever else a poem may be. What do you mean, whatever else a poem may be? I don't like this condescension. I don't like the condescension involved in that statement, in that assumption. Um, I do not like the fact that a, a, a work of art is being likened essentially to a commercial jingle. The same type of commercial jingle that he tried so wholeheartedly from which to distance poetry in that first chapter. Uh, I don't know if I've got it marked, but if, if the chief concern of poetry is to provide enjoyment, why is poetry so profound? Why have these things, um, right, the verse, on the other hand, that comes to you over the radio celebrating the virtues of a breakfast food will not, for all its rhyme and rhythm, fit into any conceivable definition of poetry. So you, you're arguing with yourself there. Um, if the chief concern of poetry is enjoyment, then the best part of waking up being Folgers in your cup is profundity. And there's no, this is simply an inane argument. And I don't know from whence the courage comes to make it. Because what are you talking about? What are you talking about? To who? who to whom is this poem supposed to be enjoyed? This is another thing. Um, Enjoyment is such a qualitative statement that it cannot be branded as a quantitative measurement. But carrying on from this, this is the last quote I have for this chapter. The truly obscure poem, that is to say the poem not easily susceptible of apprehension, much less of comprehension, makes for laborious reading too often unrewarded. For as enjoyment is one of the avenues that lead to understanding, so understanding is one of the, opponents, the components essential to enjoyment. Mr. Elliot, in his lecture, The Frontiers of Criticism, delivered on April 30th, 1956, at the University of Minnesota, a lecture on the new criticism, we called it, in which the importance of enjoyment as over against mere explication, is emphasized, has, it, has summed it up and succinctly when he says, has summed it up succinctly when he says, I do not think of enjoyment as understanding, as distinct activities, one emotion, one emotional, the other intellectual. It is certain that we do not fully enjoy a poem unless we understand it. And, on the other hand, it is equally true that we do not fully understand a poem unless we enjoy it. This is something that Wheelock continues by sort of lukewarmly accepting, though not necessarily identifying with. Um, but I think that it is the crucial 
the crucial thrust of literature in general is that the the true testament to intelligence is not being able to read Shakespeare and see greatness, is being able to pick up Dr. Seuss and make layers therein. No offense to any of you Seussians out there. But I think that the enjoyment of literature should come from within the self, as new criticism sort of makes the act of criticism come from within the text. The text is only as deep as the individual reading it. And that is important to all art forms, that is crucial and consequential to all art forms. Um, and I am not sure what else to make of this chapter. So, oftentimes, I'm an atheist, and I read through apologetic texts. Now, apologetics is not as nice as it sounds. Apologetics is basically someone trying to justify their religion. It just has a funny sounding name like an apology. And oftentimes in those texts, just as oftentimes in any text where someone is making an assertion, and this happens in, 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 in fiction as well, so I don't know why I'm putting so many qualifiers on this. There's a point, I'll just use the, op, uh, the apologetics as an example. So there's a point in most of these apologetics texts where you're reading along, you're like, okay, I can see where you're going. I can see the concessions necessary to employ your worldview. I can accept them. I can entertain them. That does not mean that I have to accept them. But then there is oftentimes about halfway through those books a point where and I'm going to use vulgar language, the author starts believing their shit doesn't stink. A point where someone becomes so full of shit that they can say literally anything without fear of consequence. And I think, if I may make this observation about something that is going on now, I think that's where uh, Jordan Peterson has made his mistakes as well. He was making a lot of sense with things until he sort of bought into the fact that Jordan Peterson was Jordan Peterson. Baby, I can say anything, and it's just true. And that seems to be the point that we're getting to in this text. So I am really apprehensive moving forward. I, I said last video that moving forward, we might not actually answer the question, what is poetry? But there was no doubt in my mind that we would get some great quotes. Uh, Wheelock, to that point, through the first four chapters, had been good for two or three of those really stunning sort of quotes per chapter. This chapter had none. And I am hoping this is not that dire turn towards being so full of shit that he simply says, whatever and doesn't care about the consequences. So, that is all I have for this episode of What is Poetry by John C. Wheelock. John Hall Wheelock. I don't know why. John C. Hall, I think, was a, an actor, and that's why I keep trying to do that. But be sure to join us next time for Chapter 6, which is titled On a Certain Resistance. Maybe he's talking about me. Um, if you like this sort of thing, hit the like button because it really helps us out on the channel. Subscribe if you have not already and you enjoy this sort of thing. If you want to be notified the next time we drop a video in this series, make sure that you hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button in order to get notifications. And if you'd like to help us make more content here on Strip Coverlet, there is a link to our Patreon, as always, to be found in the description below.